Good morning. You know, I've always been such a big fan of Christmas music. Uh, ever since I can remember, I love all kinds of it. I, I especially love the sacred music, obviously, that, that points us to Jesus, that reminds us of the reason for why we, we do all of this every year. But, but I'm even admittedly a sucker for the more commercialized Christmas, Christmas music as well. I just, it's not a very popular thing, I don't think, for pastors to admit, but I love it. Michael Buble's 2011 Christmas album, Chef's Kiss. I mean, it is, it, because you get both, right? I mean, you get, you get Silent Night, and you get It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas. It, it's the best of both worlds. This year for this Advent series, we're going to be talking about the four traditional themes of Advent, hope, peace, joy, and love. And this year I thought it'd be fun to connect these themes to some well-known Christmas carols that, that will hopefully kind of give you just a different spin on these themes, that will connect you to them in a way that maybe you haven't thought about before. And so for this first week, uh, hope reminded us of, of this oh, little town of Bethlehem that Kelsey and Caleb just led us through. And I especially love the first stanza. This was first written in 1866. Incidentally, uh, fun fact, the O Little Town of Bethlehem that we know and love is a completely different melody than uh, O Little Town of Bethlehem in England, Scotland, and Ireland. Totally different melody. Uh, very, very strange. We have the superior version, just to be clear about that. <laughs> but the first stanza says this, O Little Town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Such a beautiful picture, right? Of the small town of Bethlehem, still and quiet at night. And as the people are sleeping and dreaming, the young virgin goes into labor and gives birth to the Savior of the world in whom all of the hopes and fears of every human being will eventually be realized. Hope is an essential part of the human experience. There was a study that I read about recently conducted by neuroscientist Tally Sherritt that uh, found a across a, a vast number of landscapes of different people some really interesting things concerning hope. Number one, hopeful college students, she found, are likely to have higher GPAs and are more likely to graduate than those who are hopeless. Hopeful athletes will perform better on the field, will cope better with injuries, and have a larger capacity to make mental adjustments when needed. Uh, one study of the elderly found that, that those who were hopeless had two times a chance of passing away during the study window than those who were hopeful. Hope is powerful. It's powerful. And yet, it seems to wane during the holiday season, three out of five Americans report that they have uh, been negatively impacted on their mental health during Christmas. Christmas has a negative impact on their mental health. Over half Americans say this. Between the stress of buying gifts, the increasingly busy schedules of parties and social gatherings and shopping, plus the gatherings with family members, some of whom might be unpleasant to be around, some of whom might even be toxic to be around, Christmas is hopeless to many people, as it turns out. Even the music takes its toll on people. One study in 2017 revealed that listening to cheerful, jolly Christmas music can actually be harmful to you. It noted the continuous playing of Christmas music in the car or at stores reminds people of all the things they need to do before the holiday arrives. So it's strange, isn't it? At a time of year when people should be reminded of the enduring hope that we find in Christ Jesus and the first advent is actually one of the most hopeless seasons on the calendar. Hope is a critical component of the human experience, and it is even more so a critical component of the Christian experience. Christians have, and this is really what I want to talk about this morning, a very unique and important connection to hope, a, a unique connection that separates us from the rest of the world. Christians have a relationship with hope that is altogether different from the world's relationship to hope. In, in other words, hope serves as a unique function in the Christian life that it does not serve in the non-Christian life, and there are at least a couple of reasons for this. Number one, hope is defined differently for Christians. Our understanding of hope is, is different. So when you think of the word hope or hear the word hope, it's not unusual for people to think of sort of like this wishful thinking, right? I hope I get what I want for Christmas. I hope that I get a promotion at work. 
I hope the Dallas Cowboys win the Super Bowl. Wishful thinking. <laughs> it's fun to think about. It's fun to imagine it happening. But, but there's no guarantee or even reason to expect these things to happen. But for the Christian, hope is not wishful thinking. We could think of hope as confident expectation. Confident expectation. Our hope is built on certainty. And there's a reason for this. We're going to talk about that throughout this morning. But, but I want you to understand that, that we define hope differently for Christians. It's not wishful thinking. It's confident expectation. Beyond that, the second thing that sort of sets us apart is that hope is developed differently for Christians as well. So how do we grow in hope? I mean, that's one of the questions I want us to answer this morning. How do I become a more hopeful person? How many of you would like to be a more hopeful person? You're like, no. We have a freedom group for you. Yeah, I mean, I think most people want to be a hopeful person. We just don't really know how to do that. We don't know how it happens. But if hope is a central aspect to how we live out our faith, I need to know how to develop it. And for Christians, it's developed differently than anyone else. So how do we grow in hope? Our text this morning, I believe, answers that. If you have your Bibles with you, open them to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 is where we're going to be for the morning. This year in this Advent series, rather than looking at the more traditional gospel narratives that celebrate the hope that came into the world in the first Advent, I want us to consider what happens in between Advents. Now, a helpful question to answer that some of you may be thinking as I use that word over and over again, Advent, is what does Advent even mean? What is that word? Advent comes from the Latin adventus. It's a word that means arrival or coming. So the first advent or arrival of Jesus refers to the birth of Jesus. The gospel narratives cover this well. The second advent or the second arrival of Jesus then refers to what we often refer to as the second coming of Jesus, wherein he comes back and establishes his kingdom once and for all and puts to death Satan and reigns on the earth for all of eternity. But what about in between Advents? What about right now in between Advents? How does hope and peace and joy and love work itself out? I believe Romans 5 not only gives us a picture of what hope looks like, but how it increases in our lives as we await the return of our Savior. So if you have your Bibles open, Romans 5, let's look at the first two verses together, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. How do we grow in hope? First, Paul is going to detail the prerequisites that we need for hope. Now, what are prerequisites? They're, they're requirements, right? They're requirements needed before you move on to the next thing. If you've ever been in college, you know that in order to take certain classes, certain classes have prerequisites. If you want to take calculus, you have to have pre-calculus as a prerequisite. Uh, if you were going to take an advanced grammar course in a, in a language of some kind, French, Spanish, Hebrew, Latin, you would need first the prerequisite of a beginner's course to learn the alphabet and the basic grammatical structure and how verbs and nouns work before you can take something advanced. There are, there are prerequisites that give you something that you need before you get to the next thing. In the same way, Paul, in this passage, he's going to talk about the pathway to hope. How do I develop hope in my life? But notice there are prerequisites before you get to the pathway. And notice what these prerequisites hinge upon. The very first phrase in verse 1. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith. In other words, there is no hope, not biblical hope, without faith. Faith is the mechanism that makes hope possible. It's a prerequisite to it. You could think of it as a funnel of sorts. If you've ever used a funnel to attach to like a bottle with a small opening that you want to pour liquid into, very difficult to do that. But if you have a funnel, you're able to put all kinds of things into that bottle. Faith, when attached to your life, funnels into you certain benefits from God. And the first one here is justification. Paul says we have been justified by faith. Faith funnels into your life justification. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be justified? It's the Greek term dikaiao, and it's a word that means literally to pronounce righteousness or to pronounce righteous. 
Faith in Jesus Christ, in other words, funnels into you the declaration, God's decree, that you are now righteous, not based on anything you've ever done, but on the work of Jesus Christ. You see, Advent celebrates the birth of the Savior, Jesus, in a manger. But Jesus doesn't stay in the manger forever. The story moves from the manger to the cross. And it is on the cross, not the cradle, where justification is purchased for you. And that justification comes to you, into your life, through faith. Through belief, faith, an active, kind of actionable idea in your life towards Christ. Faith funnels to you God's decree, righteous righteous. Not only that, but second, notice else, what else funnels to you. Peace. He says, as a result of, of being justified, of being declared righteous, you are now also at peace with God. So, so we have peace through Christ. Some of you may not be aware of this, but prior to your faith in Jesus Christ, you were actually at war with God. You're like, well, I don't remember that. Well, you were. That's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Even if you wanted to submit to God's law, which let's be honest, you didn't. You couldn't. You were incapable. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Prior to faith in Christ, Paul says you were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. You were set against God and his commandments. You were opposed to his kingdom and at war with him. But all of that changed the moment you were justified by faith. When you were justified by faith, God not only declared you righteous, but he handed you a peace treaty as well. War is over. Peace has begun. Faith is a funnel for justification, for peace with God. Third, it's a funnel for grace. Look at verse 2. It says, through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We have access to the grace of God. I love the terminology here, access, the Greek prosagoge. It's a word that's not used often in the Bible, only three times in the New Testament. But in extra biblical literature, we find this word often used to describe the kind of special authorization or access that a ship would have to dock in a foreign nation's harbor. So if you were traveling to a foreign land and you were going by boat, you would need special authorization to dock in that nation's harbor before you were able to enter into that land. What Paul is saying here is that Christ gives you by faith special authorization or access into the, the harbor of God's grace. And what is grace, by the way? It's unmerited favor. It's an unearned gift. It's a gift that you did not deserve, but you were given anyway, not based on anything that you did. And so understand this, your initial faith in Jesus, when you, when you became a Christian, when you believed the gospel, which, by the way, that belief was, was a gift in and of itself, that is grace in and of itself, but that faith gives you continual access to the unmerited favor of God. What that means is that you don't just receive grace one time when you came to faith in Christ, you have continual access to it as you live your life and are transformed into his image. And notice, as a result of all of this, what Paul says. He says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That word rejoice, it's probably better understood or translated as boast or brag. We boast, we brag about all that God has done on our behalf. It's interesting that up to this point in the book of Romans, for the first four chapters, Paul has spoken negatively concerning boasting. Boasting is something you don't do. You don't boast in what you've done. You don't brag about what you've done because nothing you can do has any value apart from Jesus' input or working in your life. But when it comes to the work of Christ, brag away, friends. Boast away. It's totally appropriate to boast in the work that God has done in my life. You ought to tell everybody about what God has done. If you want to be a hopeful person, a more hopeful person, you have to have these prerequisites first. You cannot be a person full of hope if you've never been justified. You can't do it. You have no hope if you haven't been justified. You're still condemned under the law. Paul says in Ephesians 2.12, while you are separated from Christ, you have no hope and are without God. Justification is a prerequisite for hope. You can't be full of hope without peace as well. You... If you are not at peace with God, you're still at war with God. 
And that's a war you can't win. You can fight that battle. You will lose it 10 out of 10 times. Peace is a prerequisite for hope. You, you can't be full of hope if, if you're still trying to earn God's favor. You won't be able to do it. You'll fail. It will not work. You will fail every time you try, and every time you try, you will fail. It's impossible to. You have to be given special access to the grace of God through Christ in order to have any semblance of hope. These are prerequisites. These are prerequisites. Now, here's what that means practically. Here's what it means for us so far. If you're not a Christian this morning, this is where the train stops for you. We're about to talk about the pathway to hope. The pathway to hope is closed. The gate is shut for you if you are not a believer. If you are not a Christian, you do not have justification. You do not have peace. You do not have grace. There is no hope. You have to start here. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. If you're not a Christian, your chief objective this morning is believe the gospel. Because check this out. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the promise of scripture. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified. Justification by faith. You're without hope if you don't have it. But with it, you're ready to move onto the pathway to hope. There's no hope without Jesus, not biblical hope at least. You can have all the wishful thinking you want. There's no biblical hope without Christ. If you want biblical, lasting, unbreakable hope, it begins and it ends with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you have received the prerequisites, you're ready to jump on the pathway to hope. So let's do that. Let's keep reading. We'll break this down. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, not only that... But we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. This is probably the most unmerry Christmas thing I could say to you on week one of an Advent series, but I'm going to say it anyways, this is what Paul says, so take it up with him. The pathway to hope begins with suffering. Merry Christmas. <laughs> right? It, it, the pathway to hope begins with suffering. Notice, if we get this word again in verse 3, rejoice or boast. Paul starts by saying, yeah, you can rejoice or boast in the work that God has done on your behalf. But beyond that, there is another, another instance where it is appropriate to boast or brag, and that is in the suffering that we face as God's people. Now, why in the world would Paul say this? What is good about suffering? In short, the answer is nothing in and of itself is good about suffering. Suffering is not an intended component of creation. Uh, it's a result of sin. So if you remember in Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth. We talked about this last week about how he rested on the seventh day. Right before that, at the end of the sixth day, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it says, And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Creation at this point, it's done, it's complete, it's very good, it's perfect, there's nothing bad in it. All of creation is good. Now, of course, you know if you've read the Bible at any length that it, we don't make it three chapters before we mess this whole thing up. Sin enters the world, and with it comes suffering. So get this, suffering is not an intended component of creation. It is the result of sin. And it won't always be this way. Right? One day God will totally eradicate suffering. It will be erased in the second advent when Jesus comes and he destroys Satan and he puts away all that is evil. He ushers in his kingdom. He will radically undo suffering. Revelation 21 verse 4, one of the most hopeful passages in all the scripture, says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Neither shall there be no mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. They're gone. They're in the past. They will never return. That is our future promise as Christians. It is not our present reality. Now, presently, we must endure suffering. But I want to give you a truth this morning that we're going to build off of, rather Paul is going to build off of in verses 3 and 4, and that is this. Followers of Jesus do not simply endure suffering. We enlist it. We don't simply endure it. We enlist it. Look at what it says next. Suffering produces endurance. So suffering is not something that we just sort of go like, okay, right? But no, it actually does something. 
It develops something in us, endurance. The Greek hupomone, it's a, it's a compound word in the Greek language. It's a combination of the Greek preposition hupo, which means under, and the Greek verb meno, to stand or abide in. Literally translated, this could be understood as to stand under or to abide under. It conveys the idea of standing under something of intense pressure, but not being crushed by it. To, to have endurance, then, means to be able to continue forward under intense pressure without buckling under it. So, for example, uh, a few, I guess, the, earlier this year, beginning of this year, I began using the Stairmaster a few days a week. The Stairmaster is a modern-day torture device. <laughs> it was contrived in the mind of a maniac. It is a uh, machine of suffering in every way. When I started using the Stairmaster, I could barely stay on it for 10 minutes without literally almost dying. It was a spectacle, I'm sure. The people in the gym where I attend were probably very concerned. Uh, they probably thought something was wrong, which there probably was something wrong, right? I can do the Stairmaster for 45 minutes now. Yeah, my, my heartbeat has dropped 20 beats per minute. My blood pressure decreased significantly. What happened? I became conditioned to suffering. Yeah. As a result of that, I have greater endurance for suffering now. I can stay on it longer without being crushed under the pressure of it. This is what Paul is getting at here. When you suffer in life, and you will, because you live in a fallen world, rather than trying to just sort of endure it and go along with it, enlist it to condition you to give you greater endurance for the difficulty still lying ahead. Because every time you face difficulty and God sustains you through it, your capacity to suffer increases as well. And look what that produces, verse 4. And endurance produces character. Now character, we can think here of character as confidence or trustworthiness. It's the Greek dokime. It's a word that means the state of having been tried and approved. Something that has been tested and approved. We know it will hold up. We know it works well. The level of confidence, in other words, that comes from enduring raises because every time I endure, I'm more and more confident that the next time I will again endure. When I step on the Stairmaster now, it's not just that I can do it, it's that I know I can do it. Why? Because I did it the last time, and the last time, and the last time, and the time before that, and so on and so forth. It wasn't easy, but I have confidence because I've done it before. There's a track record. I know I can do it again. The same is true for difficulty or loss or suffering in life. I know that if I have suffered before and survived it because Christ has sustained me through it, I have confidence moving forward. He's going to do it again. It won't be easier. You need to hear that. It won't be easier. You will just have been conditioned to it to do it longer with better endurance. And then look at the end of verse 4. He says, and character... Confidence produces hope. Remember at the beginning when I said that our definition of hope as Christians is different from the world's? The world thinks of hope as wishful thinking, but we think of, of hope as a confident expectation. This is why. This process. It's as the hymn that we all love and have sung so many times before says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ justifies us by faith, declares us righteous, issues peace with us between us and God, and continues to pour out his grace into our lives in that while we suffer, we don't simply endure it, we enlist it, and that suffering produces greater endurance. That greater endurance produces a confidence that God is going to again and again and again show up in my life when I need him most. And that is a confident expectation or a hope that lasts, that's much bigger than wishful thinking. It's a hope not in myself, not in my own ability, but a hope in Christ who has never failed me and who never will fail me. And who will one day return back to me and put an end to all of this once and for all. But in the meantime, will sustain me as I live out obediently this life towards his glory. That is hope. That is a hope that does not fail. 
That is a hope you can confidently expect and count on time and time again. It doesn't matter how bad things get. It doesn't matter how painful life is. And it will get bad and it will get painful. And you will feel as if you are not able to do this. And on your own, you can't do this. But you have hope. By faith in Jesus Christ, you've been justified, given peace, and given grace. And as a result of that, suffering leads to endurance, and endurance leads to character, and character produces unbreakable, unshakable hope. December is a hard month. I realize that. It reminds us of all the things that we need to get done. There's very little time to do it. It gets stressful. It gets busy. It gets fast. It's hard because it means family members and family gatherings, and, and some of you have families you don't get along with. Some of you don't have families at all. And so, and so it produces a sense of, of loss and mourning that you, that you have other people around you celebrating with in all these ways that, that you don't get to participate in. And so that's hard. It's hard because it means more expectations on you. And the more expectations, the more stress. And that's on top of the fact that you might already be in the middle of something difficult right now. If you've lost someone recently that you love, that's hard, plus you have all the December stuff. If you have health issues, that's hard, plus all the December stuff. If you have mental health issues, that's hard, plus all the December stuff. It's a hard month. We, we dress it up in lights and decorations and, and, and fun music, and, and that doesn't erase the difficulty that December brings along with it. And so as this month begins, I want you to consider the ways in which God might produce in you greater endurance character and hope through the difficulty you are either currently experiencing or will experience in the near future. Practically, what it means is this. Don't pray for less suffering. Pray for the ability to enlist that suffering for greater endurance, character, and hope in your life. Pray that, that God would give you the ability to see suffering as an opportunity to become a more hopeful person. That by the end of this month, when December rolls off and January begins and 2024 starts, new year, new you, <laughs> that maybe by God's grace, you will be a more hopeful person on January 1st than you were on December 1st. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be amazing? We do have one final reminder of hope this morning that we're going to celebrate by remembering the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. December is a time where we often celebrate the manger. This morning we're going to move from the manger to the cross and the empty tomb and be reminded of the ultimate reason we have for hope, which is eternal life and forgiveness of sins through the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I want to give you, as always, some ground rules as we begin. Number one, this is for believers in Christ. There's a lot of things that we do at City on a Hill where we welcome both Christian and non-Christian to come and hear God's word preached and, and to sing. Uh, the Lord's Supper is something reserved for believers in Jesus Christ. It is specific to Christians. Number two, this is not meant to be taken lightly by Christians. So 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29, Paul says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So if there's some kind of undisclosed sin, unconfessed sin, something you've been keeping hidden, something that's sort of eating your, your, your mind and you're your just sort of gnawing at you from the inside, I would advise abstaining and getting right, doing what is necessary and coming back the next time we do this so that you don't take this in an unworthy manner. We're warned against that. We're going to do this a little different than we have done the last several times. I'm going to read the full passage from 11, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. And uh, once I have read that passage, Pastor Kelsey is going to lead us in a portion of a song. And as the elements make their way to you, you take them at your own leisure. Don't wait for me to give you any kind of, of signal. You just go about it prayerfully, worshipfully, as you remember the broken body and shed blood. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we confess only a holy God would justify us by grace that we might have peace with you. Only a holy God can take suffering wrought by sin that we are guilty of and turn it into hope. Lord, we love you and we thank you. That's all we have to bring to you is our gratitude what you've done on our behalf. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.